chapter one and introducing us to the world of anatomy and physiology. So let me share my computer screen with you and let's get started. Alrighty, so anatomy and physiology, this is going to be the discipline of studying the human body more specifically because we can study anatomy and physiology of dogs, but we're going to be studying the human body. So why does this matter? So understanding anatomically and physically how and how the body works and what it's composed of will allow us to communicate accurately with colleagues in the health system and understand what we're talking about. Um, there's different videos within each one of my PowerPoints, so I'll skip over the videos, but I definitely encourage you to go back and watch these videos while you're studying. So, anatomy by definition is going to be the study of the structures of the body parts. So when you think of anatomy, think of everything that you're going to be able to see with the naked eye or everything that you'll be able to see with the use of a microscope. When you think of anatomy, think of the actual parts that come together to make up what you're looking at. So if I'm looking at a cell, what are the organelles that are coming together to make up a cell? Or if I'm looking at a bone, what are the chemical products? What are the cellular components, the collagen fibers, and so on that are coming together to make up a bone? Physiology is going to be the study of the function of those body parts and the body as a whole. So now we're not looking at the actual parts, but we're looking at how do they work. So if I'm looking at a bone, I'm not, no, I'm not paying attention to, physiology-wise, I'm not paying attention to that it's composed of calcium and phosphorus and that it's composed of connective tissue. I'm looking at how does this bone work? What function does it serve the body? How does it allow the body to function most properly? So we're looking at function, physiology, compared to anatomy, structure. So when we're studying anatomy, we can kind of break up the discipline of anatomy as a whole into um, macroscopic a a a anatomy or gross anatomy, and then we can divide it also into microscopic anatomy. So with gross or macroscopic anatomy, we're looking at the study of large visible structures. Most of these structures under this umbrella are going to be ones that we can see with the naked eye. So if I'm looking at regional anatomy from a macroscopic level, I'm looking at parts of the body that I can see in a particular area. So if I'm looking at my chest, I'm looking at those anatomical structures there. Systemic anatomy is looking at just one organ system, cardiovascular, um, endocrine, so on. And then surface anatomy at the macroscopic level is looking at those internal structures that we can see underneath the skin, but they're still visible to the naked eye. So veins, bones, um, muscle tissue, and so forth. Microscopic anatomy is gonna deal with the structures that are too small to be seen with the naked eye, so we need a microscope to assist us in understanding what those um, structures are. So, excuse me, we have two separate disciplines under this umbrella. Cytology is gonna be the study of cells, and then histology is gonna be the study of tissues. Developmental anatomy is going to study the anatomical and the physiological development throughout life. So, in, Embryology, for example, is going to be the study of the development of a person before birth. So to study anatomy, one must, anatomic, must know anatomical terminology and be able to observe, manipulate, palpate, and osculate the actual body. So when you think of these terms, think about going to your doctor. I go to my doctor because I'm sick. A couple weeks ago, I had strep throat. So I went to my doctor because I had a fever, it hurt to swallow, and I wasn't feeling good. So you can imagine when the doctor comes in, what do you think that she's going to do, right? She's going to palpate my tonsil area. Okay, that feels a little swollen. She's also going to observe, so she's going to look in my throat. Okay, your tonsils are really large. And then, of course, we're going to run a test, but just from manipulating the body or palpating the body, we're able to get a good understanding of what the problem could be. And we're beginning the process of studying anatomy, those structures that make up the body. So in physiology, we do have some subdivisions as well. So we can study the body from a functional aspect 
on, um, we can divide it into our organ system. So if we're gonna study the renal system, that's looking at our kidneys and the urinary system, cardiovascular system, and looking at how does that function. To study physiology, one must understand the basic physical principles as well as the basic chemical principles. And what we mean by this is, I have to be, be able to understand functionally how these organs, these systems work based on maybe electrical currents or pressure, movement. Um, when we're talking about physical, I mean, chemical principles, you know, how does calcium aid in heart contraction? How does, you know, calcium aid in muscle contraction? How does this neurotransmitter aid in allowing the nervous system to communicate with the rest of the body? That's what we're looking at when we're talking about those physical and chemical principles. So anatomy and physiology, in terms of learning them as a whole, they are inseparable. There is no way that you can fully understand the body without understanding both. And when I'm in class, I typically get my students to do this activity, and I encourage you to do it as well. So I tell them, pick an organ. So a lot of students tend to say heart. And I go, okay, tell me about the heart. Tell me the anatomy of the heart. So I'll have students go, oh, you know, it's composed of muscle, cool. Um, you know, it's got cells, okay. And throughout this dialogue, it never fails. Someone will go, um, the heart pumps blood, and I go, stop, that's not anatomy. What is it? It's physiology, it's telling me the function of the heart, which is accurate, but if we're studying the anatomy of the heart, you can't aid, you can't put in that functional aspect. But if you're fully describing an organ or an organ system or even a cell, eventually to fully understand it, you've got to incorporate both anatomy and physiology. And so that gets us into the principle of complementarity of structure and function. Being able to understand the structure of a part of the body as well as understanding its function and understanding that its structure is going to determine its function as well. Because if you think about it, if the heart didn't have muscle, would it be able to contract? No, because muscle and its main function is contraction. So understanding the anatomy and the structure of an organ really does also determine its function. If there's no muscle associated with the anatomical structure, is it going to be able to contract? No. Just like if there's not a neuron associated with a part of the body, we might not be able to communicate with it effectively and so on. So that is the principle of complementarity of structure and function. Function is always going to reflect its structure and what a structure can do depends on its, on its specific form. Um, and so we have this diagram here showing us the differences between the type of teeth that we have. So our teeth in the front are going to be specialized to break things apart or tear things, or as our molars are going to be spe are more specifically going to function in grinding. Can I break something off with the molar? I can, but that's kind of uncomfortable, you know, if I'm sticking a carrot all the way in the back of my mouth just to tear it off. Um, just like, can I chew with my two front teeth? Uh, technically you can, but you're not going to grind that food up the way it needs to be with these two front teeth because structurally they're not made to do that. Okay, so moving on to section 1.2, how do we organize the body? And we are going to organize the body from its most um, simplest form to its most complex form. I do want you to learn each one of these levels from the simplest to the most complex form because you might see this in future assessments. So we're gonna start off with the chemical level. The chemical level is going to, um, I'll talk from this picture here. The chemical level is going to consist of atoms and molecules and looking at chemically how we begin this process. So we've got hydrogen and carbon dioxide, carbon. Um, we have nitrogen. And so if I put carbon with two molecules of oxygen, I can make carbon dioxide. If I put two molecules of hydrogen with a molecule of oxygen, I can make water. So the chemical level of organization of the human body is looking at atoms and molecules and compounds. So then we transition to the cellular level. And the cellular level is going to be composed of molecules and compounds coming together to make a cell. So looking at putting molecules and compounds together 
and eventually making carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, putting them together and eventually making a cell. We, we transition to the tissue level. The tissue level is designed as similar cells working together to form a tissue. And when we talk about the tissue level, the biggest uh, difference between the tissue level and the organ level is the tissue is going to be composed of similar cells. So if I'm looking at cardiac tissue, I need cardiac cells, right? I can't have cardiac cells and bone cells coming together to make cardiac tissue. It just doesn't work. So tissue level, similar cells working together to make a tissue. We transition to an organ. So an organ is going to be different tissues coming together to make an organ. So if we're looking at the heart, we're going to be looking at cardiac tissue. We're going to be looking at some connective tissues as well. Different tissues coming together to make an organ. Then we move on to an organ system. So in this particular diagram, we're looking at part of the cardiovascular system. So looking at different organs coming together to make a whole organ system. So we've got the heart, we've got blood vessels, and all of those together are going to make up the cardiovascular system. And then lastly, we have the organism, which is going to be the human person. Um, that's going to be composed of all organ systems working together to allow for that organism to function properly. And in the human body, we have 11 organ systems, which we'll get to in just a moment. So what are the, the requirements for life? What components are necessary for us to even be alive? And we have some basic functional uh, processes that need to occur in order for us to live. So we go into the first one, maintaining boundaries. So we need to have some type of separation between our internal and external environments. Um, and this makes sense, you know, would it be beneficial to the human body if we didn't have skin? And so all of our vital organs and our muscles and our blood vessels were just exposed to the external environment. That type of person probably wouldn't make it too long in this uh, aggressive world if there was not some type of skin barrier. Or even think about your plasma membrane that separates the uh, cellular components from its extracellular fluid. So that's what we mean by maintaining boundaries. Movement. So our muscular system allows for us to move because our muscles contract and that aids in movement. So we need to have movement of our body parts through skeletal muscle. We need to have movement and contraction of the heart and our lungs. We also need to have movement of substances in the body. So think about blood flowing through our blood vessels. Um, think about processes of digestion, urination, defecation, and so forth. So being able to move waste products out of the body, nutrients into our cells and through our body, um, hormones and different things like that. Contractility is going to refer to movement at the cellular level. Responsiveness. So we need to be able to have the ability to sense and respond to a, stim a stimulus, whether that stimulus is internal. So let's say there's a chemical change um, because I took ibuprofen or there's a hormone that's released in the body that my body needs to respond to. Or externally, it's cold outside, so I shiver, or I, you know, ooh, it's cold out here, let me put a coat on. Um, we need to be able to respond to those stimuli so that the body can remain in balance. So we also have processes of controlling our breathing rate. So if I am exercising, I want my respiration rate to increase so that it can accommodate more blood flow, more oxygen, and so forth. We need to be able to digest food, break down food so that we can absorb nutrients because if we don't have processes of digestion, how is the body going to be able to gain the nutrients that it needs to keep going? Metabolism, that term is going to refer to all of the chemical processes and reactions that occur within our cells. So when we think of metabolism, think of processes that break down our uh, organic compounds, which is catabolism, and then also think of the processes that form those compounds, so we're forming proteins and carbohydrates, and that is anabolism. So when we put those together, catabolism, anabolism, that gives us metabolism as a whole. We need to be able to remove waste from our body excretion, so we're going to be able to digest products so that we can gain nutrients, but of course, everything that we break down within our bodies, our body doesn't need. For instance, when I, you know, had that great ice cream yesterday, so good, you know, my body broke down the components of my ice cream that it needed, and then it's going to eliminate the waste products. So we need to be able to get rid of that waste, whether that's through urination, 
defecation, the release of carbon dioxide out of the body because we inhale oxygen and we, and we exhale carbon dioxide. Um, toxins that we get in our bodies, we need to be able to have a process of getting them out so it doesn't harm the body. And then reproduction and growth. So we need to be able to reproduce our cells. At the cellular level, we need to be able to reproduce more cells. So think about, you know, when you cut yourself. So I cut myself here. And most of us don't think about it, but, you know, it makes a lot of sense when we, once we think about it. I cut myself. Let's say my cut is not even that deep. But I want that area to heal. I want my skin to regrow. I want whatever's damaged to repair, to be repaired. So at the cellular level, we need to make more skin cells so that we can repair the skin cells that we've lost. Um, and then we need to make sure that whatever bacteria that gets into our bodies, that we get rid of it. So we need to make sure that we're able to reproduce cells. And then we also need to reproduce our cells, leaving an offspring so that as a species, we don't die out. Growth is necessary for life because we need to be able to increase in size and increase in body parts to keep our functions um, possible. So imagine being born and you're an infant and then never getting bigger, you know, never being able to grow up. You're just an infant. Um, and imagine, you know, if intellectually you grew up, so I'm infant size and physically I, I have restrictions as an infant, but mentally I'm a 25 year old. Imagine the complexity there. <laughs> You're like, okay, I need to get up and walk, but I can't get up and walk. I can't wipe myself. I can't feed myself. Um, that, that, it just wouldn't even work. So we need to be able to grow and increase in size, increase in organ size as well, so that we can functionally continue to be successful and um, live as long as we can. Okay, so if you weren't aware, us humans are composed of multiple cells. Um, so to function, the individual cells must be kept alive. And a lot of times people may not think about it, but keeping the body in balance and keeping our cells healthy really does begin at the cellular, at the cellular level. Our individual cells being able to function holistically as they should, and if all of the cells are functioning well, then our tissues function well, which means our organs function wells, which means organ systems function well, which organism function wells. You see how we do that right there? <laughs> um, so like I mentioned before, we have 11 organ systems and I'll go through each of these organ systems pretty quickly. What I want you to learn from each one of these is the name of the organ system. I want you to be able to recognize a few of the organs or accessory structures of that system and its basic function. So what you see here in the PowerPoint, honestly, is exactly what you need to know for chapter one, because of course, we're gonna delve deeper into these organ systems as we progress through the textbook. So the integumentary system is going to consist of our skin, hair and nails, and functionally, it's going to cover our external body. It's gonna protect our deeper tissues and vital organs. Our skin is able to synthesize vitamin D, and it's also gonna house our cutaneous receptors such as pain and pressure and so forth, and our sweat glands and oil glands. The skeletal system is gonna consist of bones, joints, cartilage. So it's gonna protect and support the body organs, and it's gonna provide a framework for the muscles to use to allow for movement. Um, our bones are also going to be the site of reproduction of blood cells, and our bones are able to store minerals like calcium and phosphorus. The muscular system is going to consist of skeletal muscle, and it's going to allow for us to move. So it's going to primarily focus on movement and allowing us to maintain body pressure, I mean body posture, and also when our skeletal muscles contract, they're going to produce heat, and that's going to be um, important for us to be able to maintain our body temperature. The nervous system is going to consist of the brain, the spinal cord, and our nerves, and it's going to allow us to respond to stimuli very quickly, um, whether that stimuli is internal or external. The endocrine system is going to be dealing with hormones. So we've got a lot of different organs associated with this. The pineal gland, the pituitary gland, the testes, ovaries, thyroid, thymus, adrenal gland, the pancreas, and so on. The endocrine system is going to secrete hormones that will regulate processes such as growth and reproduction and nutrient use, metabolism. 
The cardiovascular system is going to consist of the heart and the blood vessels, and it's going to function in transporting blood, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, waste, and hormones to and from the body. And then the heart is going to be the, the actual pump that pumps blood throughout our blood vessels. The lymphatic system is going to also be our immune system. So some of the organs associated with it are going to be the thymus, lymphatic vessels, the thoracic duct, our spleen, our lymph nodes. The lymphatic system is going to function in picking up fluid that's leaked from the blood vessels and returning it back to the heart. It's also going to be... Um, like I said, our immune system. So we're going to have lymphatic cells that are going to aid in cleaning up debris, getting rid of bacteria and viruses that shouldn't be in the body that will harm the body. The respiratory system is going to consist of the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, our lungs, our trachea, our bronchi, and it's going to keep blood constantly supplied with oxygen and deliver carbon dioxide back to our lungs so that we can exhale it. The digestive system, so we've got our liver, the stomach, oral cavity, esophagus, large intestine, small intestines, rectum, anus. And this system is going to function in breaking down food so that we can absorb nutrients and eliminate waste from our bodies. The urinary system is going to consist of the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. And it's going to eliminate nitrogenous waste from the body and also aid in regulating water, electrolyte, and pH of our blood. And then lastly, our reproductive system. So we have the male reproductive system that's going to include the prostate, the penis, the testes, the scrotum, the ductus deferens. And overall, the male reproductive system is going to aid in the reproduction of um, male gametes, sperm. It's going to aid in the um, production of male hormones, andro androgens, and it's also going to be, um, it'll also function in the reproduction of other people. The female reproductive system is going to consist of mammary glands, our ovaries, uterus, vagina, uterine tubes, and the overall function is the production of offspring. Also, we have the production of Female gametes, which are eggs, female hormones, estrogens, progesterone. We have the ability to carry a child, to feed a child with our mammary glands, and then, of course, participate in the copulation. Alrighty, so we do have some survival needs. So when you're looking at requirements for life, we talked about digestion, excretion, metabolism, um, maintaining boundaries. Survival needs are the actual components that we need to allow for those physical processes to occur, maintaining boundaries, digestion, excretion, growth, reproduction, and so forth. So nutrients. Nutrients are going to be chemicals that are needed for energy of our cells and for our cells to work. So we need carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals, and vitamins. We need oxygen. That's going to be essential for the release of energy from our foods. And when we get into AMP2 um, and we get to the chapter talking about metabolism, you'll see that oxygen is really needed in um, a particular cellular process that allows for the cell to make ATP, which is the energy source. Um, we're not going to talk about that in detail now because we don't discuss it in AMP1, but oxygen is needed for those cellular processes. The body can only survive a few minutes without oxygen. Without oxygen, everything shuts down. All cellular processes and um, reactions shut down. We need water. Did you know that? I'm sure you knew that. <laughs> um, water is the most abundant chemical in the body. It provides the watery environment for our cells and also for our chemical reactions. Um, and it is also a fluid base for secretions and excretions. We need to be able to maintain normal body temperature. So the average body temperature for um, individuals is going to be 98.6 degrees. Of course, that can vary depending on your personal body temperature, but Normal body temperature is needed so that our cellular processes can function optimally.